All right, welcome back. So, um, yeah, that was a great intro. Glad everybody's here, you know, climbing up to almost 600. So, uh, the title of our first talk is From Ready Layer One to Ready Player One Why Today Marks the Beginning of the New Open Web. Now, what does what problem does blockchain actually solve? Why haven't we solved it yet? You will learn why the story started with Bitcoin and later gave us Ethereum and what the next chapter is going to look like and is about to begin. And why today's tools allows you to do things that weren't possible before. It's time to start building. And here to talk about it is going to be Ilya, co-founder of NIR, and Eric Troutman. Eric Troutman leads the NIR Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to enabling community-driven innovation and a driving force behind NIR Protocol, a decentralized application platform which gives developers access to open finance and the open web. So excited to have these guys to join us right now. Oh man, all right, welcome Eric. All right, let me get my screen share fired up here. I think we're in good shape. Awesome. Well, I'll uh, let you kind of hang out and we'll let Ilya join. I oh, know uh, I'm, I'm taking the ball to start out with and I'll hand it off in the middle here. Perfect. So thanks a lot, Dustin. Cheers. All right. So good morning. Um, some of you may have just seen me talk, um, but for those who haven't, welcome. Uh, this is this is the first official talk of Radio Layer One. Uh, which has been a colossal effort uh, to get together in, in just a short period of time. Uh, so basically what this talk is, is essentially a high level look at what is it that blockchain is actually solving and why, what, what are, basically why blockchain uh, and why haven't we solved it yet? Hey, Ilya, um, you, you, you can hang out or you can jump on when it's, uh, when it's in the middle uh, where we are currently live. Um, so as far as uh, Ready Player One, the movie goes, um, let me pull that up here. So in Ready Player One, Wade Watts lives in primarily a digital world. Uh, so the economy is actually fully bridged. Uh, digital money has taken over the real world as opposed to the other way around uh, as the global currency. The game has effectively become the single platform through which all of life happens. And it's built around this game, uh, which which effectively is a world that's created on rails. And so what I mean by that is it's a world where genuine creativity rules the day and, and people uh, with some everyday hustle uh, can basically build worlds of their own. So it, it's almost like the real world on steroids. Um, on top of this platform within which they've all built, uh, anything is possible. Uh, so the platform itself is actually what enables this entire world to exist. Uh, the problem with that is that the platform is actually quite centralized. Uh, so, so the vision of the future is actually completely up in the hands of, uh, you know, you're either going to get this guy who who wants to give you ads until until you, the edge of getting seizures, or you have a naive kid who's basically going to run the entire world himself. Uh, and the entire thing is decided by an Easter egg hunt, which to me sounds like the most centralized possible future. And it actually shows exactly some of the problems with a centralized platform when the keys, literally, the the keys are handed over to the wrong person. But bear with me, uh, I do think it's a useful framing mechanism. And uh, it's one that, that I think, you know, I don't think we'll be the only people who use it um, because it is, it is still a really interesting vision of the future. And it's a good springboard uh, to figure out, you know, what, what is it that we're doing and why are we even here uh, in the layer one space? Uh, so just a quick note, uh, there is an Easter egg uh, hidden uh, in plain sight, as it were. And so we'll, we'll get to that at the end of this. I just wanted to do a, do a, quit of a, a bit of a foreshadow there. Um, so uh, t today we're actually kind of already partway there uh, in this player one future. Um, so we're all, you guys are all logged in, presumably from your homes. If you're in an office, it's definitely not in a country that I live in. Uh, you're, you know, we're going to virtual concerts. We're, we're, we're participating in immersive gaming platforms. And we're, we're, we, we've already taken a very meaningful step into the digital world. Um, but it's not, I mean, it's not just because of COVID. I mean, th this has been a forcing function, true, but it's also, um, you know, it, it's it's something that started long before COVID came along, and it's going to continue long after COVID leaves. Uh, one thing to note, though, is it's not just about gaming. Uh, I mean, if if you look at it, uh, 
this this promise of decentralization and the promise of, of an open monetary financial and web system, uh, these all have their toes in the door. Uh, there's a, there's almost a billion dollars currently locked in DeFi. At one point, there was a billion dollars locked in DeFi. Um, but of course, the, the, the overall financial system processes trillions of dollars. So the point is, you know, we're, we're kind of in this baby steps phase, right? We're, 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 just, we're just pushing one little nugget forward at a time. Uh, but in the end of the day, it, it's still true that real life is actually where, where everything happens, meet space, right? Uh, you know, with the default world, whatever you call it. And then let's not kid ourselves. The vast majority of people could not care less about our little sandbox and only want things that tangibly and materially improve their lives. They don't care if something's decentralized because it's decentralized. They want something that is actually going to work for them. And so the question for us is what can we do to actually help this world, not this idealized version of the world, not this world that only exists for people who are in this in the crypto sphere um, and, and so-called get it, right? And that's that's really the fundamental problem that I think we've we've all struggled to bridge. You know, there's this question of why blockchain in the first place. Uh, so actually Dustin did a great job of introducing me so I don't have to spend too much time here. I'll just note that I'm the CEO of the Near Foundation um, and our mission is to enable community-driven innovation to benefit people around the world. So the first part of that is really about how can we help drive innovation and the second part is how can we distribute that innovation. Uh, so Near, the Near protocol happens to be just one important support pillar of that quest. So I want to I wanna sort of go into the Wayback Machine and just revisit what was the vision? Like, why, why were we here even in the first place? And if, I mean, Bitcoin has actually gone through a series of narratives. If, if, if you, you know, if you've been along for the ride, uh, along the history, I mean, you know, we, obviously there was the Bitcoin pizza, right? Originally, Bitcoin was really designed to be this, to be this uh, means of, of payment, right? It was, it was designed to sort of mimic a lot of what the dollar was to everybody. Uh, you know, and since then, it's gone through multiple phases where it's it's sort of picked up momentum. It's snowballed into this rallying cry for all sorts of different people. You know, the anarchists, libertarians, money people, gold bugs, technologists, um, and then you have Ethereum, which which when that came along, it was it was it was more than just money. It was we're going to build an entire future where users are in control and where where users run the world, where. This idea of decentralization actually means pushing things back out to the edges rather than pulling them up into the center. Uh, unfortunately, it has been a long winter. Uh, you know, we we realized we realized that that users really don't like tokens. <laughs> they don't want to deal with tokens. They don't want to download MetaMask. They don't want to go to an exchange. They don't want to they don't want to wait. Uh, for for an hour for a confirmation. They don't want to wait for two minutes for a confirmation. They don't even want to wait more than uh, 200 milliseconds for a confirmation. Uh, we saw that people had problems spending decentralized money because of KYC issues. Uh, we had regulatory issues where tons of projects got shut down. And that's not to say that a lot of them weren't doing things that were worthy of being shut down, but the whole space really suffered a lot of black eyes. Uh, and fundamentally, what we realize is that you can't just magic up a new system and ignore the old one just because the institutions and the people that, that just because you want to, you actually have to bring these people, you have to bring these institutions along with you uh, in order to kind of blend the two worlds. So decentralize everything maybe, maybe needs to be replaced a little bit more realistically with how do we find, how do we chart that path into decentralization or how do we, how do we make the tools that we're creating in the decentralized world more useful to the real world? So even during this winter, we have made progress. And that's that's one of the coolest pieces of this, right? Like that's that's why this is ready layer one. The whole point of this is that a lot of the hurdles that we have faced, we've systematically broken down very slowly, very carefully, but progress has been steadily made every single day and month along the last several years. Uh, the tooling is getting better. Uh, performance is getting better. The usability that's offered by these platforms is changing in a way that, that materially steps forward in, in, in breaking through some of the issues that we had that prevented users from adopting these things. And just as fundamentally on the regulatory side and on the governmental side, we're seeing movement where, you know, where, where I think the first wave of enterprise adoption was really driven by sort of this sense of FOMO uh, and, and during the boom, and it was more of a, like, let's chase the crazy money and the crazy ideas. I think now we're really starting to see enterprises and even governments take on this technology and start to start to really look at what is it that makes this good. You know, it, it's gone from this this blockchain is everything. It's all put into one big pile, uh, and and anybody who's working on it can say that that 
you know, they have the solution for everything to actually understanding and teasing out the nuances between the different platforms, between what these different things do and what they're actually good for. And that's, that's helped us to progress. And that's helped us to get to the starting line that we're at today. Today is where the layer one platforms come in. So layer ones are shipping. It's taken time. <laughs> these platforms, as I can attest, are phenomenally complicated. There's no question about it. Uh, Bitcoin looks like looks like a, a plus minus calculator compared to the, the, the supercomputers that we're putting together these days. And that's really hard. And there are tons of unknown unknowns that, that we've had to systematically break through on the way forward. And <laughs> I apologize on behalf of every platform that has had to put out a delay notice again and again and again, where the hype has slowly transitioned into feeling more jaded and more betrayed by the sense of vision uh, and, and to never have it actually connect with reality. But this is actually a time where the layer ones are shipping and that's one of the coolest pieces about it. The next generation of layer ones are shipping. Uh, there's a lot of speculation, there always is, but I think more fundamentally, we've taken meaningful steps forward and we're ready. So are we ready? <laughs> are we ready to go beyond just having that toe in the door of decentralization? Are we ready to are we ready to, to take a meaningful step forward and figure out how do we merge these two worlds, this world of the future, this vision of what reality can look like, and the, the present that we have today? So let's take a walk through Wonderland. So in the beginning, uh, I, I want to basically revisit uh, some of the narrative. I want to look at some of the narrative that's brought us here and, and reframe things just a little bit with a slightly different set of mental models. So the first one uh, was open money. This idea that Bitcoin was obviously a revolution in, in, in ideas and technology at the same time. It brought us a really interesting, very valuable concept, digital scarcity, um, but fundamentally it was really about access to money. It was about open money that could be permissionlessly earned, permissionlessly saved, and permissionlessly spent. Everything else was kind of a nice to have on top of it. So open money, uh, what does it actually do? I mean, it really is fundamentally about it. Um, it, it's a way to access currency, a way to store value outside of the traditional banking system and make it more accessible to everybody else, at least in theory. Uh, in reality, it's been a little bit more challenging than that. I think the, 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 vision, the vision was pure. Um, and what we want from it is, is a globally accessible currency that anybody can spend, right? I mean, it, all that matters, that there's this sort of idea of, of user experience equilibrium, that, that what fundamentally matters is actually just what makes life easier for a user. And, products will develop that will find a way to serve those needs. And this is kind of where we are with open money. And what we want with open money is we want something that we can spend without a thought, right? In, in, in the movie, uh, to, to sort of circle that back, the, the way that they spend this money is basically sort of flicking their fingers around and, or, or even just using voice controls and wanting to buy things. Um, and, and, you know, real world isn't quite that easy. The traditional financial system, when it serves people well, it actually does an okay job of that. You have one click check, checkout on Amazon and things like that, but still fundamentally, uh, it's, it's, it's a challenging, uh, it's a challenging world, especially when you're talking about bridging it with a decentralized currency like Bitcoin. Um, so what we have, what's happened to the narrative of the original open money was that we sort of took a piece of it and we optimized for that. Uh, so Bitcoin is a, fan a fantastic store of value right now, mostly because it's holding its value and it's going up. Uh, is it a unit of account? Well, uh, basically these are the three core, as I'm sure, intimately familiar. Uh, this idea of money comes down to store of value, unit of account, and medium of exchange. Those are the three characteristics that are commonly used to describe money. And Bitcoin is a great store of value as a unit of account, which is basically are things priced in Bitcoin. Well, I, it kind of only works under, under the umbrella of the crypto world. Uh, as a medium of exchange, uh, since the Bitcoin pizza, there has not been an awful lot of Bitcoin that's been that's been exchanged for, for, for goods and services. Uh, it's been much more of a hold asset and less of a, a transactional asset. Now, that's not to say there aren't other platforms that are that are kind of attempting to, to bridge that, of course. Um, but, but is it accessible to everybody? No. Uh, many people are trying, but it's still, it hasn't quite gotten there. Um, so I want to bridge, I, I want to bump up then a level into open finance. So this is basically where Ethereum came in. So if, if you sort of use Bitcoin as the hallmark of what open money is, and now we have this idea of open finance, which is also called decentralized finance or DeFi. And what Ethereum gave us 
uh, sort of unintentionally was was uh, it really highlighted this this idea of like what happens uh, beyond just open money but what if we make money work because finance is actually the act of taking money and making it do work making it making it create value in other ways than just the three you know the three that I just talked about um, so so basically you know ethereum as we all know was you drop a computer on top of money and instead of just a plus minus calculator you you can do some phenomenally interesting things um, so uh, DeFi really became, has become sort of the standard bearing use case for Ethereum at this point. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, the breadth of the vision that originally, I think, united the community around Ethereum, but it's been a really, really amazing uh, proof of concept uh, for what is possible. And so the idea of, of what does open finance solve, uh, again, it, it's still about access. Um, so many of these things are fundamentally about access, but uh, it goes it goes beyond just currency, and it's about making the instruments that drive that currency more useful to people and more accessible to people. So that's credit, that's lending and hedging and insurance and returns, all sorts of things, and providing that opportunity for billions of people. So what, what we want from open finance is it goes back to the same thing. It's about user experience. It's we just want something that works. You know, we don't care about the fact that that you you know that you have a bank that has a hundred thousand people you have to support in your compliance department. We don't care about you having to manage your balance sheet. We don't care about the regulators which prevent you from stealing the money from me. Um, all of these are bloated costs that sit in the existing financial system. All I want as a consumer is a functional system, and I want that to be distributed to anybody. Um, so what we have now is, as I said, is a great proof of concept. It's it's a concept. It's a proof of concept for two things. It's one is is this idea of uh, of composability, uh, and so the composability is is one, I think one of the most powerful ideas that that you're going to get out of open finance. Uh, and the gist of that is that essentially components are produced by different developers throughout the system. And I think Ilya might be talking a little bit more in depth about this, but different components are produced by different people, and then they get permissionlessly piped together. And so you you can actually have a wallet that that immediately sends your balance into a lending platform that immediately transfer, transitions it into other currencies and ultimately pipes you back into earning a return. Whereas a consumer, uh, in theory, you actually don't have to know that any of this is going on. Uh, that's an incredibly powerful idea. Um, the problem is we haven't quite gotten to consumer friendly. And, and what consumer friendly requires is a vast improvement in the overall functionality and the overall performance of these systems. Um, so I wanna bring in the, this idea of the open web as well. Um, so the open web, open money, I think, is very, very familiar to everybody who's ever heard of Bitcoin. Uh, I think open finance is very familiar to the idea of anybody as an idea to anybody who's familiar with Ethereum. Um, the open web is something that that represents the fulfillment of the original promise, I think, that we all got excited about when we first learned about Ethereum. Uh, but it's something that has pulled back quite a bit under the crushing weight of everything that pushed us into this winter. As I said, the usability challenges, the regulatory challenges, all sorts of things. Um, but what if, as an idea, it's still there? Because fundamentally, open finance showed composability, but in the end of the day, money is just data, right? So if you can move money, you can move data. What if we, so this idea is what if we built a system that allowed you to piece together finance uh, in the same way as finance, but it operated on data in general. And you could you could basically abstract it upwards a level and and allow anything to be treated that same way that could benefit from everything that, that composability actually offers. Um, so for instance, uh, the open web solves some interesting problems. And one of the key ones is essentially like, what, or two of the key ones are, are what, what holds us back from uh, from innovation. So uh, if, if you haven't, I recommend you check out a blog post by Angela Strange at A16Z. Uh, she basically talks about how every, it is, it's actually not a crypto post. Um, it's, it, it's a post that's about, um, uh, it's a post that's about how every company is basically going to become a fintech company. And it, it, she does a really, really good job of walking through this idea that, that everything eventually will become a service. Uh, so, so, or everything is actually becoming a service. So, so essentially it's kind of, you know, in, in the early nineties, uh, you know, the, the fixed costs that you had to go through as an entrepreneur in order to test an idea were incredibly high because every piece of the stack, uh, and, and her example is in, is in FinTech, but it goes well beyond that. Every single piece of the stack you had to use as an entrepreneur, you had to, you had to basically pay those fixed costs. You had to pay those operational costs. You had to pay that mind, that mental cost uh, when what you wanted to do was test your idea. So you can't possibly imagine Airbnb being tested in a world where you have to convince somebody to give you $2 million to pay for servers before you can do anything. Uh, so, so there's this idea that, that uh, 
time as the, as different layers of that stack have been have been turned into services. The the most obvious example, as always, is is Amazon uh, AWS is is a phenomenal example of how things have uh, how they basically turned just compute into a service, and it effectively changed the way that software is is is, is done. Uh, and it has been, and, and you know, you kind of use that idea across all layers of the stack, and you get the sense that the stack is starting to shrink and compress. And so, what that means is that the cost of of building a new company, of testing a new idea, of bringing the world something like an Airbnb, is getting lower and lower and lower and lower. <clears throat> One of the problems, though, is custody is still a liability, regardless. And that's whether that's custody of money or custody of data, custody of anything that is sufficiently sensitive that if you gave it to me you wouldn't want me to screw it up. Uh, so that's still a problem. <clears throat> so what we want, uh, we, we want to be able to build fast. We want to be able to innovate fast. And we want to be able to stand on the shoulders of other people. We want to take advantage of this idea of composability, not just for financial products, but for anything that's suffering from, from this, uh, this fattening of the stack. Uh, we're not just talking about toys. We're not talking about money. You know, there's anything that touches identity. Uh, there, are, there are applications across the entire set of systems in healthcare and beyond. Uh, but fundamentally, it's about speeding up innovation by removing constraints. Uh, so <laughs> the problem is uh, <laughs> right now we haven't, we don't have what it takes to get there. We're 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 on the cusp, as I've said. Uh, you know, again, I want to I want to keep tying this back to this idea that ready layer one, layer ones are ready. We haven't yet had the performance that it takes to bridge this all the way out into the consumer web. The consumer web operates at a level of scale and a level of speed and a level of user experience that you just can't do when you're proving a concept to institutional financial players. Um, so, so we have yet. But to bring it back to Ready Player One, uh, the real question is like, why do we care? You know, so so the future the future in Ready Player One was built by a single secretive genius. Uh, who is running a trillion dollar corporation. You know, maybe Apple, Google, Microsoft, one of these, Amazon, one of these trillion dollar corporations will step up and they'll, they'll produce the future, right? Maybe they're the ones who are going to, uh, who are going to bring us the next world. Maybe it's Fortnite. Maybe, <laughs> maybe Fortnite is just going to keep iterating their way up to becoming different. Um, but fundamentally, I don't actually believe that. And I, I, I hope you don't either. Uh, because I think the history of innovation is actually very different. It, it tells a different story, and that story is that it needs to be built by you. There's power in this idea that if you simplify the tools and you give people the ability to build, that that amazing things will happen. And so the example that I like to use is is essentially what happened when you removed the friction of e-commerce and spending money online. And uh, this this was somewhere around the late '90s, early 2000s, where where uh, if any of you were, were around and attempting to spend money online, it was a total shit show. Uh, before they finally pulled the protocols together, uh, they gave you, they gave you uh, secure ways and reliable ways of spending money online. And, and by, by removing the frictions and continuously improving the stack and, and getting people the thing that they ultimately wanted, which was an easier way to buy things, which was an easier way to accomplish their goals, uh, it, it took off like a rocket. And you might actually be surprised by how low a share of total sales e-commerce is. Because I actually was, I was surprised that it was only 10 and a half percent. But when you look at that chart, I mean, it's an exponential growth and that's incredible. Um, and, and so it's really, again, if you abstract the idea and you remove the friction and you give people the power, it wasn't like one company just figured it out. It wasn't just PayPal showed up and everybody suddenly could do it. Uh, you know, it, it was about giving people the tools uh, to, to put to put all sorts of uh, uh, basically giving people the tools in their websites, giving consumer the tools to reliably understand when a website was going to be secure. Uh, and, and it just it removed the friction and, and great things happen. Uh, so fundamentally, the cool thing about this and what brings us back here, the reason why we're all sitting here is because actually blockchain gives us all of this. Blockchain what didn't stop with Bitcoin, right? It wasn't, a, it wasn't an idea that, that found its fit and then it was done. It just it was done innovating, right? We went from open money to open finance. Bitcoin birthed Ethereum. Uh, fantastic step forward to make money useful. And so now the question that I have is, how do we turbocharge both of these things by spreading them out, by bridging them out to consumers with the full open web vision to bring back the original vision of what made Ethereum so cool? Uh, and, and, and what does it take to get us there? All of that is actually still based on the same fundamental technology, just used in very different ways. Uh, so it's a long journey, and it has been a long journey, as I've said. <laughs> Uh, but it, but we've taken that step forward. We're beginning to take that step forward. And there are, there are all the different protocols who are here with us today, um, many of them who helped put this on. 
and many of them who are speaking here, they've all they've all kind of clustered together in different areas, and and you know each set of protocols is kind of solving a slightly different set of problems. You have a whole bunch that are that are focusing really heavily on this open money idea. Uh, you have others that are that are really zooming in on on financial and open finance, and then you have others that are approaching. Uh, you know, they're approaching this idea of scalability as more of a specialized thing where building building uh, app, app chains, specifically blockchains for, for an individual app, or you have uh, the applications, the, the, sorry, the, the protocols that are building more of a general purpose computing platform or general purpose application platform. Um, all of these are all kind of working on these different areas of the stack, uh, but they're all driving towards fundamentally what I think is still the same vision, just from slightly different angles. So um, I don't know if Ilya, if you're still out there, <clears throat> but there is there is an Easter egg, which is not Ilya. Although if he pops up, hopefully he'll hatch. Um, future is so out what I there. Wanna, yeah, <laughs> the future is out there. Um, so we've seen what the mountaintop looks like. Uh, so I don't I don't want to I don't want to. To cross the line into shilling, but I did want to note that the Easter egg has been that there is actually, if you go to, uh, you have the link right. It's explorer.mainnet.nearprotocol.com. Near.org. Near.org. Near um, yeah, you can see that that mainnet is actually already here, which is a pretty cool thing. It's actually produced over a million blocks. Uh, officially, Genesis went live uh, on the Near blockchain, and that was uh, that was twenty second. UTC 1800, uh, and and it's been cruising since then. So that's go go take a look if you want. Um, poke at that. Uh, I did want to note uh, just because this is this is a pretty cool place and a pretty unique place. How much effort went into that? And I just wanted to use this as a moment to, to pause and say thanks a lot to the team. I know you guys are listening. Uh, congratulations. Uh, you know it's been a it's been a hell of a ride. Uh, this is the beginning of a much longer ride, obviously, but uh, it's the first meaningful step forward. So thanks a lot, you guys. But I think uh, I think Ilya, perhaps this is building time. Yep, it's building time. Hey everyone, uh, I'll queue in after Eric. It's always hard to compete with his enthusiasm, um, but I'll try. Well, I can say I had a I had a bear of a time trying to set up the, the screen share properly. So I wish you luck. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see how it works. Hi, right. can you guys see? I see building time. OK. Yeah, so um, Take care, I kind of wanted to walk through some of the use cases and kind of frameworks, how to think and how to build in this environment. Um, and to start with, you know, some Minecraft graphics of building time. So to start with, work. Like, the whole internet is built on protocols. And there was actually quite a few people in chat asking how is this, what Eric was talking about, different from uh, original view of internet. And it's not that different. And at the same time, it's very different, right? Uh, when internet was started, when you know, some of those original layers and kind of protocols were imagined, uh, I don't think anybody in their kind of mind was imagining the current world. Um, I'm not even talking about what's going on right now, but even before where, you know, most of the commerce is moving online, most of the uh, kind of finances is one way or another digital. Um, like, I don't think that, you know, fully crossed the mind of people. At the same time, uh, you know, mobile phones, if like even science, in science fiction of like 60s and 70s, nobody could like predict that we will have supercomputers in our pockets that you know we'll be using to check the weather. So we we are where we are, right? We are in this kind of interesting moment where on one side, um, like the huge companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon it had probably like one of the best quarters, uh, even with all the like terrible things going on in the world. And at the same time, kind of real real world companies and real world is uh, started to crumble. But uh, before we kind of go and review some of these things, what is protocols, right? So protocols is the idea that a lot of people share common approach to exchange 
data or uh, some kind of information, right? That's how it started, network. Like they wanted to share a piece of data between two computers and they needed a way how those computers need to understand each other. And over time, this started to build up, right? Uh, the things got more complicated because, well, there's more computers you need to route. There is uh, kind of, you want to know that your message was received, TCP uh, IP got introduced, and then obviously more and more applications got been built and they all needed some uh, type of protocol. Notice all of these protocols are stateless, which means that there's actually no global state shared between uh, uh, users of uh, of these protocols. Each pro each uh, kind of user or application has its own state. Like in the email case, right? An email server has its own uh, state on on its side, and uh, um, there's no kind of global state uh, that everyone can query. And to address some of this problem, for example, DNS was introduced, which is really this way of finding things on internet, right? How do you know uh, kind of where to find uh, things if there's no global state? And DNS is actually probably one of very few uh, stateful services. And what we know about DNS is actually at the top, right? At the root of it, there is sitting a centralized agency that decides uh, who to give kind of top level um, domains, right? So this is kind of how protocols started. Um, now, how they evolved, all of this was very slow. In general, uh, if, if anybody knows IPv6 drama, it's been more than 15, uh, sorry, 25 years since intro kind of introduction of this idea um, with different revisions and trying to put together these protocols and trying to convince people to switch to them, right? Uh, so on one side, protocols are really sticky and have huge network effects. On the other side, if, even if you do need to upgrade them, it creates a huge problem. Uh, at the same time, there's lots of protocols originally who uh, pretty much disappeared, like failed and disappeared, uh, which we don't even remember of. So what does cryptography and blockchain gives us, right? Um, and like specifically, I want to emphasize, it's not about just blockchain, it's about cryptography used kind of in conjunction and also kind of bringing this cryptography to peer-to-peer. -to -peer. So to start with, it provides us this way to build identity, right? If DNS is this kind of current internet way of finding services, uh, which, you know, is global, but it, we need to trust the kind of root of this as well as same thing for uh, SSL certificates, right? There's a root SSL certificate that we need to trust. Uh, on blockchain, we can actually kind of clearly trace and, and define logic and it will be verified by everyone. And uh, uh, it will be maintained by this decentralized committee uh, of nodes instead of a kind of centralized committee that uh, ICANN is running. We have native digital currencies and financial instruments, right? So open money that Eric was talking about. But this, what this allows to do is kind of uh, create new types of applications uh, that operate on this money directly without going through hurdles, without going through external services. Uh, we have custody of assets and data on user's side. So, and this is really a huge thing because um, we are moving to the world where there's a lot more data breaches. There's a lot more uh, kind of stolen things from uh, applications, most are fully anonymous marketplaces that are operating on native digital currencies, uh, creating like kind of financial instruments around them. The really interesting kind of frame of this is open databases. So as I mentioned previously, most protocols are uh, stateless, right? Like each node has its own state and they just communicate, uh, like protocol only defines a communication. Now with blockchain, we can actually imagine a stateful protocol, right? Where there's a state, there's a database, and there's a specific protocol how this database can be changed. So like set of APIs and uh, how this can be updated, which now provides a new way how uh, applications can be composing with this existing. And f first and foremost, it's like a framework, right? It provides us a way to build new protocols and, and applications on top of them. So like, why, why do we care, right? Because this really gave us a first time to really quickly develop and, and uh, uh, 
uh, deploy protocols, right? If before, you know, it would take years to develop, to convince people uh, to try it, uh, to kind of spin up this, like to grow the network. Now we have ways to fund them, right? Uh, obviously, ICOs uh, had their own huge negative side, but at the same time, there were a way to fund protocols, which, you know, nobody actually outside of uh, US government uh, was funding to CVIP development, right? We are able to build and deploy those protocols and kind of distribute them across many nodes that are incentivized to uh, run them or participate. And we can iterate through that, right? We can try a lot more new protocols this way. For example, out of kind of DeFi product, uh, protocols on Ethereum, right? Most of them actually were developed in the last couple of years, right? So, and with that already, you know, there's a billion dollars uh, at some point was locked in that. So there's no ways to ship before in months. And now kind of like with all the developments, we're trying to make it quicker and quicker and uh, get it closer to the user. Uh, obviously, it's a huge benefit of, especially the stateful protocols, is compatibility. You can actually link together different protocols and allow them to interact with each other in kind of novel ways. Um, the like we know examples of you know Maker Compound, Dharma, all of the things, but uh, you can think of. Uh, different applications like messengers linking with uh, financial instruments, uh, data providers linking with um, some kind of uh, machine learning applications. If before, like if you think of why, why don't we see such uh, kind of multitude of compatibility in kind of regular application space, the reason is that when you're building on top of somebody else's platform API, there's a huge risk that API will disappear because that company may exist today, but may stop existing tomorrow. And especially it's true right now in kind of very turmoil times. Um, the same thing is uh, you don't know if they're gonna change API under you, if they're gonna remove functionality, uh, if they're yeah, so, like, supported from it. The protocol provides you kind of these guarantees that you can rely on. But on the other side, it's not just about protocols, right? You can actually build applications that offload parts of the logic to protocol while maintaining a big part of logic and user handling and everything on the application side. Like right now, in this space, we kind of stuck in this like by model way, right? We think either either it's a centralized application like an exchange or um, something similar where it's like blockchain is just used as a settlement or fully decentralized, you know, not even use blockchain at all or it's a dApp, right? It's like only smart contract, everything on IPFS, there is a JavaScript based, you know, light client. And actually nobody usually does that. I think I know only like a couple applications that actually went that way. Um, but like, this is kind of logic, right? It's like either we're like fully decentralized or it's, you know, it's a centralized uh, like solution and we shouldn't be looking at it. But there's actually a large space of possibilities in between, right? We have, uh, uh, ability to offload parts of your application as a, on a protocol uh, that other people can rely on and at the same time keep functionality and business uh, in your application, right? Um, for example, uh, I like Airbnb example, even though like nobody should actually build that, but the idea is that if somebody was trying to disrupt that uh, business uh, back in the day, um, instead of trying to build a, you know, marketplace of housing and insurance mechanism, a uh, support and the front end all together, you can actually build a protocol for a uh, housing marketplace first and uh, allow it to be kind of peer-to-peer -peer independent and then build a business around that. The benefit of it is now you're not, uh, you're not operating this marketplace yourself directly. So a lot of the kind of issues that arise from operating some of the marketplaces uh, kind of are not uh, directed at you. And at the same time, you can have a lot of complements uh, that would be building around that marketplace as well and can feed more users and more listings into it. Uh, same for insurance, right? Airbnb is really just a marketplace of insurance and the service, like customer support service. So this insurance uh, that, you know, uh, can be another protocol that can accumulate funds and uh, allocate them into various things. And I'll mention some of this later. So, as I said, there's like kind of a progression. And the thing, the important thing about this progression is 
there's a lot of existing applications that can and should start leveraging sounds as technologies. And I really uh, hope like some of them will start. So for example, just as kind of high level example, right? Uh, we have Reddit. Reddit is a centralized application, right? It's running, it has uh, more than 10 million users uh, active. And um, one of the interesting things I have is Karma, which is kind of your reputation and your uh, ability to provide useful content to the, uh, to the uh, website. Um, one option is Reddit can put Karma on chain, right? So create a token out of Karma and specifically be able to still issue and control how Karma operates uh, from their own application. Now, what changed is now this Karma is a protocol instead of just a database on the backend of Reddit. Now everybody else can just build on top of it, like independently if you know Reddit exists or not, independently of uh, kind of uh, the like the you know changes inside the company. If you know if if this protocol specifically defines how Reddit company can issue or control this karma, then other developers can kind of build around it, right? So one example is this protocol can define how people can lose karma if they misbehave. Now you can use your karma as a staking mechanism to, for example, in some other application where you need to stake and get some reputation. And what Reddit gets out of it is pretty much more users trying to gain karma to be able to uh, participate in other applications. So uh, obviously like there's few benefits for them. Uh, additional monetization, right? If you can one way or another create new economy around this, and this obviously creates opportunity to monetize it. Uh, this is increased engagement, right? Now you, you opened up something that uh, before was kind of proprietary and allows people to uh, participate in it more actively because they can build other applications. And it reduces this kind of inherent platform risk when you're building on top of it. Like Reddit is actually has pretty good APIs uh, for, um, uh, for developers, but Again, building an application, especially building a business around it, uh, is uh, pretty risky. As in, like we know many platforms that have like changed and, and uh, removed APIs. Uh, but specifically, these APIs usually are read-only, right? They only provide you kind of a way to glimpse in the data inside, but they don't provide you kind of a protocol how to interact with this data, right? And again, this is the benefits of protocol, right? Of protocols is that you can actually kind of create the stateful uh, machines that everybody can interact with. So Twitter and Reddit actually already announced that they're like looking into this. Uh, sounds like existing gaming platforms uh, are looking into this, um, and especially uh, like as you know this current crisis, I think some of the financial platforms will follow as well uh, because there's a lot of opportunity how they can uh, be like benefit them their users as well as uh, create more opportunities for people outside of their main jurisdiction. So the other side of this is ability to cut through modes, right? So there's a lot of businesses right now which have a uh, like kind of a huge mode around some uh, business and they moved in, moved from kind of really attracting users and solving their problem to really extracting uh, value from their users, right? So Chris Dixon wrote this really great article, uh, Why Decentralization Matters, uh, where he has these graphs, which is like how platform and user uh, relationship evolve as platform grows, right? So it starts with uh, uh, platforms really attract, trying to attract the, um, did I, I'm, I'm back online. All right, uh, just, yeah, so, so yeah, so th there's evolution of how uh, platform kind of relationship goes, right? Like originally all platforms trying to attract more users, trying to attract more uh, complements, developers, creators, businesses. And then over time as uh, uh, platform grows and like they create a moat around their users, around their, their users data uh, or through regulations or through other, some other way, they starting to extract value from users and starting to kind of compete with their complements. Uh, 
Um, this is just a natural progression of any company which is, has shareholders and has kind of a mandate to generate profits. Um, and this is where blockchain comes in and is able to cut through this uh, modes and create a new types of businesses and create new types of value uh, for them. Um, so I just listed a few. I think there's way more uh, of possible um, possible industries where this is true, uh, and especially industries where there is regular or uh, some kind of like legally like legal modes that uh, like the companies that are in control right now are pretty much enforcing really hard. Uh, so to start with, insurance is a good example because. Uh, so in U.S., every state has special regulations uh, for insurance companies. Blue Shield, which is one of the biggest insurance providers for healthcare in U.S., has 36 subsidiaries to just be able to operate in 50 states, right? So if you imagine that you want to start a business, which is insurance for healthcare, which, you know, as, as a current moment is very important, uh, you cannot start it without starting 36 subsidiaries around the just U.S., right? And like every other country has its own uh, requirements as well. Uh, there's also huge capital requirements to just get some insurance licensing. And obviously it depends on which type of insurance uh, and healthcare is like especially complicated. There's uh, um, huge kind of associations that are very, very defensible about their position to control the market. Uh, at the same time, um, at the same time, healthcare, as we know, is like, in, especially in U.S., is really like what drives, uh, sorry, insurance companies is what driving healthcare in U.S., so it's very important to have this operational and have this working. Um, the kind of how risks and rates are working is really opaque right now. Uh, I think like nobody, especially on healthcare side, nobody went to hospital and like, I know how much it's going to cost me and like how much insurance will cover it and, you know, what I'm going to pay. Uh, same usually goes with like, you know, uh, car, house insurance. It's like always kind of a uh, like random uh, draw. Um, the benefit of kind of building in this, like latching on the decentralized system, right? And, and building protocol around this is that you can kind of avoid some of these modes and bootstrap uh, with uh, people who actually want to uh, get the service instead of uh, uh, getting the like getting into the system market, right? Um, so uh, you can kind of a transparent risk model really gain like crowd uh, and like global risk assessors uh, ability to weigh in on risk and actually uh, rate it, right? So flex market is a good example of prediction market that you can leverage for this uh, as like one of the building blocks. Um, you can... Uh, uh, programmatically allocate funds that are being deposited for insurance premiums, right? And uh, of the, like deposit them in other open finance applications and actually like, transparently see uh, how much fi finances the this insurance protocol has, right? And then on top of it, you can build an actual businesses that are serving customers in their like geography or in their like type of uh, market that people are interested in, right? Uh, which then actually deliver like specific need spe to specific needs. So you don't need to like solve hard, pro like if you have this protocol on the back end, it solves a lot of hard problems and then you actually deliver the value to the users. Uh, very similar is music, right? So music generates about 43 billion annually, but the musicians themselves only get 12%. And if before uh, this like, this was justified because the uh, labels were really uh, responsible for production and distribution, right? And it was expensive. Nowadays, the cost of production and distribution is way, way down, right? Like you can record it with a good mic uh, or like, a, like there's a pretty cheap uh, just now, and then you can distribute it by like posting it on Spotify or uh, on other platforms. But uh, labels actually control most of the uh, post like top, top uh, musicians as well as uh, production platforms and distribution platforms and create kind of this like very uh, tight loop that allow new players to come in. Like Spotify, when they started, right, they kind of uh, pretty much gave up to, to uh, 
uh, labels. So to address this, um, you can actually build direct-to-consumer distribution, right? Uh, but more specifically, the, this uh, platform be operated by community and musicians themselves, right? So instead of uh, building a kind of a mode company that uh, is easy to be uh, kind of attacked by this label, so you actually give it back to community, give it back to musicians, and build a service on top of it, provides an easy way to access this. Uh, but the kind of how music is stored, how music is played is all defined by the protocol. Uh, and of course, there's like an opportunity to do it through niche music where uh, there's no other ways to listen to this music in the first place, right? So there's a kind of a start. So Audios is an example of uh, applications that are doing that. Um, the kind of other side of this is exchanges. It's like very interesting that in blockchain, in kind of this decentralized world, the it's dominated by centralized exchanges. The uh, like stolen money from these exchanges keep piling up, but people are still mostly using them. And the reality is, is because most of the liquidity and markets are there and it's just easier to use. So really like we need, you know, better UX, we need better like performance improvements. And that's why, you know, Ready Layer One is about like actually bringing blockchains that are way more performant uh, there's people working on better UX. Uh, there's people bu building on kind of bringing liquidity, uh, but also we need to incentivize market makers who are in in reality provide uh, kind of uh, market and like right now on on the centralized exchanges they get ze getting zero fees, so there needs to be a new way to bring in them to this. But the point is like uh, like there, there is an opportunity and tooling already coming out that allows to do this, and now it's about like shifting the market into this. So what happened is, you know, a few months ago, we kind of one day just became fully digital, right? Uh, we all stayed at home and we needed to connect. Uh, and uh, we had this opportunity to uh, start working together. And uh, there's a lot of gaming uh, going on. But um, one question that still stands there, right, is who is going to control the multiverse, right? Um, the like in the original work right we have this one company like this genius who created the oasis and then uh this one company that been like maintaining it and it's not surprising it's kind of this company became evil right um so like we are building toward multiverse i mean we have fortnite we have minecraft all these places uh kind of capturing more and more uh people's time and attention but uh, what we're missing is this ability to kind of uh, take what's ours and leave, right? And uh, move around and, and be able to like not be able, not being the kind of uh, st like stuck and locked in one platform. And to do this, we really need protocols, right? We need uh, uh, protocols, how we car carry our items and assets, how we carry our identity and currencies. Um, and this is again, what blockchain is for. At the same time, like I don't think all the games should be decentralized, right? We shouldn't be trying to build all of the stuff on blockchain. Uh, there's an interesting approach where you uh, can create centralized worlds, right? That you connect with your identity and you allow this uh, game to interact with your profile, with your items, uh, and you know, during that, you you know, you are maybe in a battle or maybe you're crafting something in the RPG. And, uh, you know, this game can actually withdraw items from your profile if you lose them or uh, if you crafted something new, put them in, right? So not everything needs to be decentralized, but the important part is you have this common protocol that everybody accepts and kind of carries around. This also creates ways how to uh, kind of link worlds and uh, create new types of interactions, new competitions, new types of re-engaging users uh, through this. So obviously there's a lot of uh, companies working on Dapper, Stardust, OpenSea, uh, like providing both like components, how to build this marketplaces, how to uh, trade. Stardust has a very interesting approach of uh, this idea linking uh, into centralized game, your decentralized profile and giving permission, that app permissions to access your profile and your items. And then uh, while you're playing the game. So, but what is it 
Like, what is this digital world beyond games, right? Uh, like, in the, again, Ready Player One, Multiverse wasn't just a game, right? But, and we are really already all about digital, right? We have uh, news, we have socializing, especially now with kind of sitting at home. We have uh, concerts that are happening online. So it's all happening, and it's really important to stay connected. Since uh, um, since uh, kind of uh, corona uh, outbreak, especially in the Western world, most of the apps have seen tremendous growth, right? Uh, Zoom grew from like 10 million daily uh, participants to 300 million, right? Uh, Microsoft Teams grew 70% monthly for daily active users to 75 million. Uh, Slack is up more than 40%. Uh, Discord, 64%. There's like huge growth across the board. But at the same time, we're, we're actually very brittle. And these platforms are listed specifically because they are kind of fundamentals of the crypto. Uh, like we're all using them to connect with each other. But imagine like some of them may disappear because, you know, it's actually pretty tough financial times and some companies may not be doing very well. Um, the like what's going to happen in this crypto right i'm not even talking about the outside world so it's it's important to understand that uh we need communication that's not just uh relying on kind of centralized place but actually is a protocol right like email will still work uh like even if gmail you know completely shuts down you can still uh send emails to each other maybe we'll find different uh solution maybe run our own servers so communication peer to peer, uh, but it requires an identity, requires storage, and all of those things partially can be used on blockchain, partially uh, can be used off chain in some other solutions that use cryptography. But infrastructure is getting there, and what's interesting, it allows to start composing this with other ideas. Right? We have we can have a group chat where you need to become a DAO member to participate. You can have you know text based auctions. You can have uh, kind of peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces within chat and much more, right? Um, so just to kind of finalize, it's not just about, you know, disrupting. It's also about uh, the fact that most of the kind of existing enterprises are also uh, have a lot of issues around this, right? Um, most of the enterprises not trusting cloud with their documents. The interesting point, Facebook actually uses a on-prem solution uh, and using Outlook because they don't trust Google uh, to store their documents and their email on their servers, right? Um, the data breaches are constant, right? Like this is some old data, but the Indian service lost almost every single person in India's uh, data, right? We have Marriott losing 500 million people's data. We have Twitter, uh, 300 million, right? So like this is a constant and constant uh, problem where data being leaked out. And GDPR is on top of it, it's not really solving a problem. It just makes it more expensive. Uh, and also like for enterprises, they just need to pay money and usually just in the form of fees because they cannot be compliant. And for uh, new startups, it's actually in the form of R&D because it takes hours to uh, build something relatively compliant. And GDPR is actually like really hard to actually follow. Um, so the solution is data sovereignty, right? It's the ability to uh, have data on the side of a user and not having this problem. I'll round up. I uh, just wanted to mention that, you know, features near, we're all like, really excited about uh, kind of pushing it forward uh, together with all the other protocols and applications and everyone else uh, who is in the space and really hope that there'll be more people joining in uh, from this conference and, and uh, going forward. Just to kind of round up, um, there is a few things that uh, we have. First of all, we have a lot more talks happening uh, that people from NIR are doing. So go to near.org ready layer one. Uh, we also have a hackathon that's going to start uh, uh, right, after the, right after the conference. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, we have a pretty much agnostic and uh, founder uh, community called Open Web Collective. Uh, so check it out. There's a lot of exciting stuff. Uh, and then if you're a developer, we have a developer program. Uh, it would be exciting to see you there. Thank you, everyone.
Awesome. Thanks, Ilya. Really appreciate that. And congratulations for main announcement, both to you and Eric. Super exciting. So um, moving on, we're going to have uh, some sessions about to break out. And uh, yeah, so um, there's going to be six sessions. First session is going to be availability and validity of uh, validity in Polkadot. Uh, new VR, uh, VRF tricks availability in via in Erasure uh, coding with Jeff uh, from Polkadot. Founders guide building weatherproof companies. Uh, they're going to give a talk about the learnings that they've had from 234 founders that the NEAR team interfaced with, what is collective, and um, they will be having a roundtable with Pantera Capital and Blockchain Capital discussing current pandemic effects of a founder's journey. That's going to be with Sasha from NEAR, Alex with Blockchain Capital, and Paul with Pantera Capital. The next talk we'll be having is building blockchains with Chainsafe. Uh, they're going to cover the different ecosystems, how they're contributing to Chainbridge, a modular bridge for multi-chain arbitrary messaging or message passing. Um, that's going to be with Aiden and Greg from Chainsafe. Uh, you have Dark uh, slash Supersonic Snarks so, uh, without a trust to set up. How a dark polynomial commitment scheme actually works how to build trustless snarks from it. And that's gonna be with Alan from Nervos. Uh, you have a new human chain. That talk is gonna be far more than code, coins and consensus, depends on the layer one protocols we're discussing and building today. There are the base layer for the institutions of society 2.0, so let's get them right. That's gonna be with Lane from Space Mesh. And then the last talk we're gonna have is NFTs 2020 issuance, liquidity, and growth. Um, Coin, a Coin Fund is inviting Super Rare, Rarible, Mint Base, OpenSea, Async Art, and Placeholder to discuss recent developments in the NFT space. That's going to be with uh, Jake from Coin Fund, Alex from Rarible, John with a Super Rare, um, Colin from Async Art, Joel with Placeholder, uh, Nate with Mint Base, and Devin with OpenSea. I hope you guys enjoy it, and we'll be back for a main live session in an hour. Thank you so much.